In the last couple of videos, we've been looking at the different writing systems we have in the world. And through some combination of characters or strokes with your fingers, you will be able to send a code to your computer of what symbol you want uh, for the computer to display. But how, what exactly does that code look like? How do we get to encode the many characters we have in the writing systems of the world so that we can enter them with our input and then we can represent them in a consistent way across all of our phones, all of our computers, because you can read uh, text in many languages on your phone. So how is this done? Through a process called character encoding. And character encoding is essentially trying to find a combination of some electric or electronic medium to represent our uh, written letters. Morse code is an early example of this. So Morse code is made up of electric uh, currents, which have two uh, modes of representation. It can be a short burst or a long burst. It's very interesting to note that the representation is variable in length. So for example, for the A, you only need to, uh, to see two things, two bursts. Long, short, long. However, but for symbols like Y, you need to listen to four things. Long, short, long, long. So there's a variability in how many bursts you need to represent a character. There's one here that's just one. It's the short burst for E. In computers, we use electricity in a different way. We have a unit called a bit, a binary digit which is our basic unit of information. And it can be obviously zero or one. And if you have one bit that you can use to represent things, you can represent two things, zero or one. So A, B, and that's it. We run out of space. If you have two bits, you can represent four things. So it can be the combinations zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, A, B, C, D, and then we run out of space. If you have three, you can represent eight things. If you have seven, you can represent 128 things. And this is when things begin to get interesting. You can arbitrarily assign one of these combinations to, for example, the lowercase a, the uppercase b, and so forth. Which is what people have done in, since the 40s and 50s. The first encodings from the 1950s used six bits. Our current ASCII encoding um, was standardized in the late 60s and early 70s, and it really took off when the first Intel microprocessors were made in the 1970s. Because these microprocessors used eight bits or one byte, and this fit perfectly the seven bit representation for ASCII. And by the way, people fought for years over what exactly to do with the additional bit. Uh, but ASCII does fit in one byte with seven of its bits. And people uh, have used it to represent the Latin alphabet. So here from 65 to 90, we have A through Z, uppercase. 97 through 120, we have the lowercase. Here at the beginning, we have a lot of codes that are from when uh, people used uh, the telex machine, for example. There's codes like bell or uh, carriage return or acknowledge. Many of them we still use. For example, carriage return is what happens when you press an enter key. So this representation is stable. All uh, is uh, uniform across characters. All of them will be represented by seven bits, contrary to the Morse code, where some of the characters were represented by one unit, some were represented by four units. Here, every character is going to be represented by eight, by seven units, seven bits. But seven bits still not enough. We would still need to represent the European letters that have accents, like the ones we use in Spanish or French. We would still need to represent all of the Chinese letters and everything else. So if we go beyond just one byte and have two bytes to represent everything, we could potentially fit 65,000 letters, which is barely enough because there's uh, tens of thousands of Chinese letters. There's many writing systems in the world. So two bytes would barely cover what we need. But of course, if we have this as a fixed representation where every character is represented by two bytes, 
some very this would uh, use the same size of representation for things that are very uh, frequent, like our A, and things that are relatively infrequent, like the like a cuneiform hieroglyphic, for example. So we'll be using two bits to represent these two things, which are very different in how frequent they are. This, by the way, is the Unicode blocks for two uh, bits. And I'm sorry, it's the Unicode uh, blocks. And as you can see, there's stuff for the Latin script for non-European Latin scripts, like, a, like the letters with accents, S uh, South and Central Asian scripts, like the Vanagari, like the writing for Thailand. These are all Chinese characters and so forth. The main problem that we have is not that there's many characters in the writing systems of the world. It's not that there's many letters. Is that they can keep on growing and potentially indefinitely. This is happening with emojis right now. They are being included in Unicode and represented as characters so that then each device can represent them using their special font. And that's why, for example, um, emojis are different according to the device that you're using. But if they are being included in Unicode and more and more of them are included every year, eventually we're going to overflow and we're going to need more bytes to represent things. So every character might need to be represented by three or four. So people have come up with a type of variable size representation called the Unicode Transformation Format, or UTF. There's two kinds of UTF. Um, UTF-8, which uses up to two bytes, or 16 bits, and UTF-16, which uses up to four bytes or 32 bits. And this is most likely what your computer is using right now. So it, if it uses, so UTF-8, for example, uh, to represent characters that are very frequent, it'll use one byte with seven of its bits representing a letter, and then one bit at the beginning to tell you, I'm the only bit, byte you need to look at. So if it has a zero at the beginning, it tells you, oh, I'm the only one you should be looking at, and my content is all of the following seven bits. If um, this kind of encoding could also be two bytes long, where the first byte has a prefix that says, oh, I'm the first one of two bytes. Here's some of your character. And then the second byte has this prefix that says, I'm a continuation byte. Uh, I have data from the first one and then you get the rest. So the two bytes would have the first one a prefix that tells you I am the first part of a char of a two-part character, and the second byte would tell you I'm the continuation of a two-part character. This way, where sometimes you have one byte and sometimes you have two, you can represent most Latin Roman characters with one byte. You can represent many other alphabetical systems with two or three bytes. So for example, the writing systems from India are, you, are used three bytes. The characters from Spanish use two bytes. And you can have very infrequent characters, for example, cuneiform hieroglyphs, meroitic hieroglyphs, represented with four bytes. Uh, this is a summary of what I just mentioned. So uh, UTF-8 uses one byte to represent the first 128 characters of ASCII two bytes to represent the Latin alphabet with diacritics, other alphabets like Greek, three bytes to represent, for example, uh, writing from India, many Chinese characters, and four bytes for letters that are relatively infrequent, again, like cuneiform hieroglyphs. This is an example, of, again, of how these bytes work. You can have a character that's relatively frequent, like the Latin J, and the representation of the J would be the seven bits here, and then a zero prefix that tells you that J is represented with only one byte. So you shouldn't read any other bytes, just me. And then this is what would be stored in your memory. This is the way it would be represented in the documentation of UTF-8. So it's 004, I'm not using a second byte, and 4a for the representation of 0100, which is 41010, which is hexadecimal, a. 
So this is the representation of the documentation of UTF-8, and this will be what is actually stored in the memory of your device. For a letter like the Hebrew Aleph, you would need uh, two bytes, where the first byte has a 110 prefix that tells you that it, this is the first byte in a two-byte combination. And the second byte has a 10 prefix that tells you I'm just a continuation byte from the one before. And then you have 11 spaces for representing the actual character. And you get as a result a representation in the documentation that is D790 and a, doc a representation in your computer memory which has two bytes. So some letters can represent in one byte, some letters in two bytes. Uh, this is an example from a European, from a Latin letter with an accent. So we use this in Spanish, in French, A with a diacritic. Again, 110 would be the prefix for saying, I'm the first of two bytes. And then 10 is the prefix for, I'm a continuation byte for something that started before. And we would use 1110, 1001 for the actual representation of the letter. And we have some padding here because we're not using um, as many bits to represent this as we would uh, Chinese characters, for example. This introduces a, a strange and unfair problem. Unicode encodes a lot of characters as, for example, three bytes. For example, characters from the Vanagari, from Hindi, characters for Thai, meaning that every letter needs three bytes to represent it. This is the UTF-8 for the Devanagari equivalent of K, and this is the UTF code for the Thai equivalent of the sound K. So if a document in English and a document in Thai have the same number of letters, the document in Thai is gonna take three times more memory, just because you need three times the bits to represent that letter making these documents artificially larger. And this is uh, happening more and more because UTF-8 is becoming the dominant encoding. There were other encodings in the past which have dropped in popularity. For example, there's an encoding for Thai called TIS, which represents the Thai letters as, as just one byte long. But as it's fallen into disuse, they now need to be represented by three bytes. Um, and Yes, this has become our standard. So many good things have come out of being able to represent these characters. But as you can see, there are some issues along the way, which makes it make it so that you, uh, representations of European characters still use less memory. In summary, Unicode is an amazing thing because it lets us represent many thousands of characters from the world. It does so by being variable in size, by allowing some characters to be represented with one byte some with two bytes, some with more bytes. Uh, this is not always perfect, as you've seen from the examples in Devanagari and Thai. And as we've seen from the last few videos, in many languages, uh, providing input, it's not, it's not just pressing a key, in goes code, out comes a code. Um, for many languages in the world, input, representation, and memory storage is more complex than just hitting a key. In the next few videos, we're going to switch gears and talk about knowledge representation.